Hi, this is Chris Sarandon, and welcome to Cooking by Heart, where we revisit the vivid memories of the food we grew up with and the people and the stories attached to that time in our lives. My guest today is Billy Mann, an accomplished Grammy-nominating songwriter, record producer, and music executive whose credits have sold over 125 million albums. After completing high school and college in six years, smart man, Mann lived in his car as a traveling musician for nearly two years, and after a record deal produced two albums, he lost his desire to be a singer-songwriter, and his knack for songwriting and producing evolved into a career working with various artists and genres, and resulting in dozens of gold and platinum records. He has a long-standing collaboration with global superstar Pink, as well as working with such artists as John Legend, Jessica Simpson, Cher, Celine Dion, Ricky Martin, Martina McBride, among many, many, many others. He's been president and chief creative officer of EMI Music Global, and subsequently served as president of Creative North America with BMG. He's co-founder of a new independent record label of his called Icon Giants, and is consulting producer of the D'Amelio Show, now in its third season, on Hulu. I could go on, but let's get our chat going with the extraordinary, extraordinary, talented, prolific Billy Man. Hi, Billy. Hi, Chris. I um, I, I never know how to respond to introduction. <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't need to. Like, your accomplishments like speak for themselves. Before your, before your eyes. I know. I know, um, I know the feeling. <laughs> uh, so I usually start the podcast with provenance, with where we're from, and. I think that's a very rich part of your life, right? You're from yeah. I'm from Philly. Philadelphia. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about where in Philly you grew up. Uh well, I grew up in a I, I got the full Philadelphia experience. I lived in the suburbs in um uh Villanova, which is outside the city in a really I nice know, yeah, sub- I know that area. Yeah. And I was My there. My daughter until went I was... to Bryn Mawr. Oh, she went to Bryn Mawr. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a a little farther out than Bryn Mawr and uh idyllic suburban little town. And then, um, and then we moved into the city when I was about seven or eight years old. And then I lived in various pockets of the city, center city, Fairmount, West Philly, I went to high school in South Philadelphia. And it's a very, uh, it's a special place, Philadelphia, Uh, Mm -hmm. special in some good ways and special in some uh, challenging ways, like any other city, but yeah. yeah. um, Well, talk talk to any New York sports fan. Right. And they'll talk, tell you about I know. Philly sports. I fans. always apologize in advance for being an <laughs> Eagles fan, but you know. But I, in terms of food, it's it's challenging yeah. because we're most famous for the Philly cheesesteak and hoagies, and um, and it's we're definitely eaters, but we're blue collar town, so we're right, right. Party. <laughs> well, t- well, let's go back and tell me a little bit about what it was like when you were growing up. Was mom a cook? Mom was. Mom was not a natural cook. Mm -hmm. She was in the time in the 70s. She was a reluctant stay at home mom in that she was playing a part of that era where my dad would go off to work and my mom would take care of the kids. Although both my parents were educated, my mom never stopped studying, got her master's and her PhD. But Mm, she, uh, the kitchen was not her native. Language, so to speak. Yeah. 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 But my grandmother who lived nearby was an amazing cook. And my mom um taught me the art of not actually caring too much about what food tastes like <laughs> until oh, really? I got older and I developed like a little more of a palate, Chris. Right, honest. right. Well, so so what was it what was it like? What were her did she have specialties? Was she a sort of everyday or was it was it a labor? For her to really I, come up with stuff every day. I think it didn't come easy to her, but she, like any uh, nice Jewish mom, enjoyed watching her kids eat. Oh, yeah. um, and so she, what she made up for in sophisticated flavors, she added volume, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but what, what I do remember is um, she did have her her best dishes and Typically, they were actually more traditional Jewish food. Like she made a mean matzo ball soup. Mm-hmm. She made a great brisket. Um, and in the later years, after we moved into the city, I think she 
it was much more just how do you feed all your kids um, right. food. So how many kids? How many there siblings? Were the three of us, the three of us. But as you know, we're I'm quite jumbo sized. So yes, um, you are. <laughs> so it was more like how do I calm these kids down? Volume food, right? What were the what were the what was the sibling relationship? But boys, girls, two, one. I'm the youngest of three. I have my oldest sister is about seven, eight years older than me. And then I have a brother who's three and a half years older than me. And then there's me. Right. Um, but I ate enough for everybody. Um, <laughs> Are they large people as well? Tall? Yeah, my brother's a big, tall guy. And uh, and my sister isn't. My sister's petite like my mom. But, you know, my first recollection of food is a very random one that's woven into music, which is there was a place in the main line, which you probably heard of, called the Main Point. And it was mm. a very random music venue that was attached to a little market in Bryn Mawr. And all of these singer-songwriters in the 70s would perform there, like Bruce Springsteen and James Taylor. And it was, I, I, I hope someone brings it back because it was such an interesting music center mm -hmm. outside of Philadelphia. Right. But this market that was attached to it had kids programs. And they sold this peanut butter, which I will never forget. And it was called Crazy Richard's Organic Peanut Butter. And today, organic is kind of a buzzword. Right. But then I remember just I was obsessed with this as a little kid because it was that soupy, you know, all natural peanut butter that I just I couldn't get enough of it. And that's really I was thinking because. When I thought about you this morning, I was thinking about just my childhood flavors, mm -hmm. Crazy Richard's peanut butter. And I think it's still around. It was probably bought by some. It's, it's, it's familiar. The, the brand name is familiar. It's probably in health food stores here and there. Yeah. Who knows? But my attachment to it was to the music. And it was like, I got two treats. One was there was some music, something for kids. And then I remember seeing a show. And then it was just like, this was like, I was obsessed with this very different peanut butter. And it was very, oh. what the 70s organic peanut butter would be, which is right, in right. a glass jar and bell bottoms and frogs painted on them. And <laughs> you know. so. All right. So, so mom was uh, a, 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 a kind of utilitarian cook. Um, uh, but the the Jewish specialties were the ones that you that, that you think of as being her her kind of right in her wheelhouse. Uh, I think it's where she spent the most time with her own mom. I think. Right. Now, but that wasn't every day. What was the everyday menu like? I don't think it was good, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't want to skip too far, but it, as I got a little bit older and we lived in Philadelphia and yeah. financially we were um, struggling a bit more. It I makes getting, a big difference in terms of your choices. My mom would sort of make the entire week's food in one, starting with a base. So she right. would make a meatloaf, a, a, an enormous meatloaf on Monday. I mean, when I say enormous, I mean like right. large loaf of bread meatloaf. Right, right. And then, which we wouldn't finish. And then on Tuesday, the leftovers would then be put into a crock pot to make a kind of sauce, which she would right. then add an extra uh, can of tomatoes or something right. and some vegetables. And that would be uh, like a stew on Tuesday, which we right. would have with some rice or something. And right. then on Wednesday, whatever was left, she would boil bow tie noodles. Oh. And she would put what was left of the sauce in this huge thing. And <laughs> the joke was she called it goulash's cousin. <laughs> but I, I have to say, you know what? It was delicious, Chris. Like, I, Whoa. you can't, and what she would do is she would, and I think this is very true of working class families, would right. be, she would add potatoes and other hearty vegetables and things into the mix right. Right. to make it last longer. Yeah. And then if we made it through by Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> you were still alive. Uh, <laughs> then it was kind of uh, everyone for themselves. It was, you know, tuna fish, uh, or we we would just, we would take care of our own food at that right. point. So, And right. then well, we worked. Know, 
This is this is by the way this this is a, actually a extraordinarily creative way of keeping uh, first of all of of never throwing anything away. I mean, I've had wonderful conversations with um, Jacques Pepin, uh, the great French chef, and and uh, Lydia Bastianich, the great Italian chef, and wow. they both talk about uh, the fact that when they were growing up, you know, Jacques grew up in a very poor home in France during the war where food was foraged uh, by his mother, um, everything was used. Uh, same with Lydia. What ended up happening in, in those cuisines, Italian, French, any number of cuisines, was that everything was used over and over again in one way or another. Uh, and uh, when you chopped up, for instance, herbs, you didn't throw away the stems, you kept the stems and you put them in for stock. Well, it's essentially what your mom was doing. Yeah. No, it sounds and, like. I mean, it came in handy for me because in the years that I really, really s- struggled the most, um, just survival years living in my car, right. I, I, I learned how to make food out of anything. Just about anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you, I, I, it's, it's such a privilege. I mean, one of the things about this show that you're doing that I love is also it's such the delicacy of being able to enjoy food is it's so available to people and it's not, I didn't really think of it at the time. It was just more like, I got to like have food to sustain myself. Yeah. Right. But you can, you can have both. And I just didn't, I really didn't know until I got older about the nuances. It was just, I had like Crayola crayon colored flavors yeah, that's yeah, what, right. What the, the basic box of Crayola yeah, is not the exactly. expanded box, right? Yeah, no, exactly. I had yeah. like the, the basic primary color, so yeah, it's it's been one of the joys of my life now is to, especially you know, with my own family, is to have that to expand that palette and right. But my mom did, I think, what a lot of, and I'm saying moms because I during that era, women, yep were breaking out. My mom was very active in the, uh, we marched for the Equal Rights Amendment and Mm -hmm. she was very much an activist. And I think part of the many layers why people get divorced, I think the dynamic, the identity dynamic for my mom and my dad, one of a bunch of issues which led to their ultimate separation when I was really little. Mm-hmm. Part of it was my mom didn't subscribe to this idea that she was supposed to be in the kitchen. Yeah. And I, not that I take away from traditional, uh, say whatever traditional yeah. at the time was. Right. But I think in a way her not honing those skills was a passive form of protest. Sure. For her. Yeah. Um, like I'm not a good cook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But 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 it was also an expression of her independence. Right. No, 100%. Yeah. But it was and, there's there's a defiance to it too, right? Because right. It, it's assumed that that's her job, right? right. Even right. if she doesn't like it. Right. So to not be good at it is a way of protest too, which mm-hmm. is, you know, to my dad, will you do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, you want you want it? You fix right, it, right? Right. Uh, I can't tell you how many of my guests in in season one talked about this very thing with their mothers, who mothers who were frustrated over being tied down, not to necessarily to the children or to the family, but to the everyday, uh, and I'll call it drudgery because that's I think the way it was perceived, of cranking out food, cranking out you know making sure the kids are taken care of. And they were very brilliant or bright, very bright women who had, you know, they didn't live in this time when we have feminism and we have uh, uh, women who are independent, live independently uh, of of their family uh, in the sense that they're not tied down. Uh, but I, I, w- I want to go back a little bit to, because you had siblings, what was it like around the dinner table? Um, It was... I have, I don't know. I was very young. And as soon as we moved to the city, it was not a, it wasn't a dinner gathering as much. And I I say that, I think some of it was the stress of, um, you know, having parents who were clearly not in like a happy place in their own marriage. So I don't 
remember the dinner table as being this like mm, this place where everybody goes i don't i don't think it was bad but i don't think it was sort of everybody sits you eat and then everyone very um happy to move on with whatever their respective activities were but i think um in terms of the larger family with my grandparents um it was much more um formal actually my it, and when i say that i mean like genuinely it was i was taught manners by my grandmothers very early on napkin on lap yeah. tilt the bowl away from you when you have the soup you know you have to do this um and if i didn't do that uh you know there were yes <laughs> you 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 yeah it was you heard really, about it right yeah or you I felt it that's right exactly um <laughs> But I, um, but I, I, I think though that it was a particular time, as your other guests, I guess, have probably touched on, mm-hmm. where the American family was redefining itself roles, yeah. and it was you know the veneer of that nuclear family was was kind of coming off. Right, right. It was disintegrating very slowly. But it was it was disintegrating. Correct. Now tell me tell me about your grandparents, about particularly about your grandmothers. Um, well, my two grandmothers were very different. The one that I was the closest to was uh, my grandmother Lydia, who um, was an amazing cook. Oh, maternal maternal or paternal grandma? This is my paternal grandmother, and she was one of those grandmothers that was a much better grandmother than she was a mother. So. <laughs> That was like, you know, I was so attached to her yeah. and so close with her. And I was, I was born just after my grandfather passed away and he was Billy. So I was named after him. And so mm-hmm. I had, she sort of, I was like little Billy. So I got flooded with so much extra attention. Um, and I think that she l- used to call me the hollow leg because she would make food and I would just like... <laughs> I could consume, I still shovel it down less hollow than it used to be, but she, she, um, she made the most amazing volume based food. And I think some of it was, you realize when you come from, um, a family that's either connected to immigrants, which most American families are, or connected to larger families that you're there's a practicality to the food that you make. And she grew up uh, in Chicago and her mother was um, bedridden, very ill. And she Mm -hmm. had three siblings. So she raised as the oldest of four, the other three siblings while she was growing up. And she was Mm -hmm. absolutely movie star gorgeous. Like, and when I say that, I know people, there are photos of her that are just so arresting Mm -hmm. and um and she was just she was a lady even wherever she was very like proper she made a meat pie chris i I don't know what kind of drugs she put in it that (laughs) caused you to be obsessed with it but it was enormous and i think because she had her two brothers and her sister and herself and her father to feed she she did a much better job at volume (laughs) food than my mom did but she made a meat pie that was absolutely insane in a pie crust that was, it was like deep dish, but times two. So it was like, literally it was like a meat cake. Yes. And it was um, like a pot pie uh, almost. Yeah. Yeah. But enormous. Like imagine a pot pie, the size of like a large birthday cake. Yeah. She made birthday cake, which by the way, my sister has the recipe. She made a pink cake with cream cheese icing. That to Ooh. this day is the greatest cake ever. And I think this year is the first year that Jenna, my wife, and I actually got close to you. You and Joe will need to come and try it. It's insane. Oh, um, she made a brisket that I don't know. Some people said that it's like the butcher was the right butcher, but she mm. used some weird hybrid of ketchup, olive oil, garlic, and yeah. a whole bunch of other things that she never wrote down. Mm-hmm. Um, but her kitchen was the kitchen for me. That's mm. I would, and she was the one that gave 
me that bowl with the the rubber spatula with mm-hmm. the icing and I could just sit and watch her right. perform basically for hours. Right. So she included you in the preparation? Very much so. Well, and she like in the best way got so much pleasure not just about feeding me and then right. watching me eat and then saying, you know, you've had enough and then would come back with a larger plate. More- <laughs> but it was the bragging rights to her friends when we would go somewhere. Right. And I was, you know, skinny as a bean pole and she'd say, "You should see this kid eat." So <laughs> now, uh did did you spend time at your grandmother's uh house more often on holidays or just sort of in general every once in a while now and then? No, all the time. And I think because of the erosion of my parents' marriage and my siblings were older and more independent, I spent right. a lot of time with her and I think in retrospect, I think she was sort of insulating me from whatever stuff was going on with my parents. Right. And so she, I spent a lot of a lot of time with her every right. week, you know, a few Escape. days a week. Escape. Yeah. And she was great. She was like, we had fun. And um, what was her name? Lydia. Mm. Ah, interesting. She was, yeah, she was amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So so then you're you're uh, you go from suburban uh, Pennsylvania, suburban Philly, Pennsylvania, into yeah. uh, Central City. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you're you you're off. By, by now you're a little older. You're going to school. Obviously, uh, was mom packing school lunches? Um, or were you eating at school? In the beginning, she would occasionally, I'd have a mushy peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but then eventually I, w- I would, you know, eat school lunches. I was right. in a lot of different schools, Chris, between fourth grade and high school. was a It was a challenging transition for me going into the city. I, I was, um, I, I mean, for starters, I was... I was adjusting to like this idyllic suburban life and all of a sudden I was in the city Turned and, into, you know, yeah. it was uh, fighting and gangs and all kinds of stuff. And I, so I wound up uh, um, moving through a bunch of different schools. Um, mm. uh, as a years. result of the family moving or as a result of getting into trouble? Uh, it was a result of, uh, look, I was getting into trouble, um, but mm. it was, my grandmother, who was an amazing, an incredible uh, cook, was also, you know, uh, the way I grew up around her was very much, you know, she said, do a thing. I did it, whatever she said was sort of the rules. Um, mm-hmm. And when it came to fighting, she would say, never start a fight, ever. Never start a fight. Right. But if someone starts a fight finish them and that was yeah 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 so that was probably not the best advice I ever got. (laughs) right but but, uh but i was in a lot of different schools i finished i was at bridmar elementary out there near where your daughter went to school and then moved to the city and then i was in i don't know maybe six different schools by the time i got to high school yeah wow so but you finished you finished high school fairly quickly yeah. And part of that was, um, I mean, I loved when I went to, I went to the high school for creative and forming arts in South Philly, which today is in this beautiful, gorgeous building in South right. Philadelphia. Right. But when I went was in the, in the projects in South Philly, we shared the school with another couple of schools and it was, you know, it was an amazing experience. Like I found my people and I think as a parent now, you know, yeah. The only thing I care about when it comes to my kids and them finding their way is finding their people. Yeah. And um, I really found my people there. You were in music before that, yes? Yeah, yeah. I was in music. I mean, music was my outlet all through this period. But I, because of that, I was never, um, I could never sort of drop into a scene or a thing that I felt like, like myself. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to the music and art in Philadelphia, um, I, I, I mean, my class was the roots. I sang choir with boys to men. It was, oh. uh, it was, I mean, it was just a, 
it was today would be a master class in music and yeah um but it was it was a it was an amazing experience but to get there was uh, i've been more elegant since i think <laughs> 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 It's like right. embarrassing, but it no, is. not necessarily, because we all have to, you know, we all have all have our individual journey, and the journey that's how you ended up where you where you are now. I'll tell you something really funny, Chris, which is um, after the third school that I went to in the city, mm -hmm. and it was after the sixth grade, and I was going to seventh grade. My mother, who was a total hippie said, I found this school for you because they were basically running out of schools for me to go to. Right. And it was called um, Alternative Middle Years, the Amy School. And my mom just spoke to her. It's like an alternative school. And um, I remember driving into North Philly with my mom and going into this office building. <laughs> and you get out of an elevator on some floor. And I was maybe almost 13 years old or so. Yeah, And I was a kind of a big 13 year old kid, not very big. And there was a woman that buzzed me in through bulletproof plexiglass. And my mom brought me <laughs> off and she was like, have a great day, honey. Like real, like, you know, like, um, think of the mom in almost famous, you know, the Fran, mm -hmm. uh, character. Yes. And mm -hmm. my mom was very much in that, you know, you're going to do great. Bye. And then left. <laughs> and and these kids in the seventh, eighth grade at this school, they were men and women, Chris. There was yeah. like, the, the, these guys had deltoids and goatees. And I was like, oh, I was going to die. And, <laughs> but as, as luck would have it, um, the Philadelphia public schools that year in the 80s went on the longest strike that they had ever, to this day, that there was mm -hmm. like a, a couple of months. And then I, I commuted outside to Philly for middle school. Mm -hmm. And um, and I still have friends from that era, and it started to calm down a little bit for me when I did right. that. But right, um, and and from what I understand, you were you became uh, uh, proficient in a number of different musical instruments along the way. Yeah, I think um, I started with I started playing with whatever I could, and in Villanova, interestingly enough, the music teacher I had in Villanova was the same became the head of the music program in that middle school. I ultimately went yeah. to after I yeah, almost yeah. went to the uh, juvenile detention school that I managed to get out of. And um, I started with the violin and um, the valve trombone and I played guitar early on, but I really, I saw my brother who's a musician and my sister who's into music and anything they were into, I thought I want to do it too. Right. Um, but I was, I was good at picking, picking it up. And I was, I, what I really enjoyed the most was making up my own chords and my own little songs. And I didn't really know what that meant, except that I felt like I had an outlet. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I, I started playing on the street in Philly, busking on Chestnut street. I started when I was maybe like 12 or 13. Wow. I would just go out there to try to make some money because things right. You know, if I wanted some extra stuff at home, it was a mm -hmm. way to, to do that. To make your own money. Yeah. Yeah. You end up finishing performing arts high school in Philly, and then you're off to college. You went to school where? Uh, college I went where? to Hampshire College in Amherst, Hampshire. which, by the way, was the food at the school. You don't really know what the food is at home yeah. until you, you go somewhere else. Right. And I just remember... And this was a school, it was a very expensive school. I had a great scholarship and, and grants and things to mm -hmm. go there. And I went early, um, which was great for me. And I think it was my my grandmother, again, really encouraged me and my dad, too, to get out of Philly early because, um, you know, it was there was yeah. a lot of distraction there. And I yeah, somehow yeah. I never I, I sort of knew all the kids. I knew the gangs. I knew who was dealing drugs. I, right. I a lot of my friends that got into it and I just was lucky that I just, it was never my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the food at college, you know, first off, I went from being pretty much a minority as a white person where I went to high school to Amherst, Massachusetts, which was like, uh, it was, I mean, separate from it being a very elitist yeah. 
in the best way, like yeah. college town, towns, Northampton to Smith yeah. College, yeah. Mount Holyoke, UMass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, to say the freshman 15, it was more like a dare. Like I dare the food at college to make me <laughs> gain any weight. Like I just was like, it was like all you can eat food, yeah. which I had never yeah, yeah. seen before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but when I went to school, I, I, I didn't finish because I was, uh, I, w- it wasn't that I was like extra bright. <laughs> I think it was just like, I was an extra hard worker and I had the, I think it was maybe George Bush, the first George Bush presidency. And they had cut a bunch of the grant relief for students. Mm-hmm. And my family was like, we don't have the money for you to yeah, yeah. go. So either transfer or you're going to have to figure it out. And right. so I worked at El Greco pizza, delivering pizza. Mm. Mm. And, um, and I did double the work and I, I was like 19 as a senior in college and exhausted. Wow. <laughs> and off you were. Now, was that when you started um, becoming a, a road musician? Yeah. I, I went back to Philadelphia. I got hustled by, um, you know, some gangsterish management types. Yeah. And, uh, and then I just, I kind of had enough and I got in my car. I had a Nissan Sentra. It was a, uh, it was the greatest car. Uh, I actually have a tattoo of it. You probably can't see. It. <laughs> um, we all remember our first cars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I don't want to forget it because it was no really humbling. And my mom went to this warehouse in South Philadelphia, and this is in a before Costco was around. And she, for my trip as a gift, she bought a huge crate of Chef Boyardee beef ravioli. <laughs> And she and I remember just the thump of it into the trunk of this car, right, right, where I had like a, a single uh, futon, you know, sort of roll up mattress, right, and my guitar was in the car itself, right. And when I, if I didn't have money for food or I was hungry, she put in a note with a a very sweet note, and my mom was she was amazing, and it was with a can opener, and she's like, you know, if you ever. <laughs> don't have any food you know you have right. this yeah yeah i really look back at that i haven't thought about it in a long time like this but i that was my mom's way like she was kind of saying i not i'm i know i'm not the greatest chef but um here's this is the best i can do yeah. so that yeah. i know that you're going to be okay and it was but uh, also also when you think about it it's the perfect way of giving you an option for sustenance if you don't you know if you're not able to to do it on the road canned food it doesn't go bad you know lasts for a long time yeah and by the way it was delicious i mean based on you know when you're hungry you can afford absolutely you kidding but yeah so (laughs) absolutely um, and and so you were you were driving around the country yeah, and I left and you... Philadelphia, and I drove with the season. So when it was it was around um, the fall when I left at first, and I headed south because I knew the winter was coming, and I didn't want to mm-hmm. drive this thing. And so I went uh, down through Virginia, and I stopped in Asheville, um, which is a beautiful place. Yeah, gorgeous place, Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah, gorgeous. And I was there for a bit, and then I went to. Um, Auburn. I knew like some girl from who went to Auburn there, Mm -hmm. which by the way, uh, if there's another time, I'll tell you the story about driving, (laughs) driving into Auburn during old South day, but not realizing it was old South day, which old South day is like, uh, if, if, you know, I don't know how to describe it, except I was driving down a deserted, what felt like a deserted road to get to the university. And there were, Mm men in Confederate army uniforms on horseback galloping next to my car, looking at me. And I thought I was like <laughs> in some weird back to the future thing that, right, right. you know, I was going to, I was going to see the end of me, but um, I really, I have to say I discovered America on yeah. that trip and yeah. it's, it's a pretty rich, incredible country, even though oh. we have our, Issues. It's yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I I was I did a tour when I was in graduate school where we did we were in two station wagons in a truck, and uh, I was the lighting director and played Romeo. Right, 
and we and the truck had you know the the basic the, the flats in it and we'd pull up to what we play schools high schools and colleges basically incredible and it was one of the great experiences in my life you know 35,000 miles over 8 months of just one nighters yeah now were you playing in venues particularly were you booked into venues or were you no i i mean this is again, this is before the internet it was before any i had a cb right. i had a cb radio a magnet ah antenna on the top of the car right and i had like a cb radio so that if i i was traveling by myself so if i was in trouble i had like right. a breaker one nine um <laughs> but i just would go um and then i'd play on whatever the local main street was right um and then i try to go into bars and places to play and then if i knew someone there um and i spoke to them they'd try to book me someplace and then i'd stay as long you know if there was a place where i was having a good run mm -hmm. um you know and there was a couch for me to sleep on uh then i would stay longer and s some places i stayed longer than others some places mm -hmm. i you know I, I i can't say i wanted to stay in arkansas texarkana that was <laughs> that was not my jam i was happy to move along but to move along yeah uh, but but there were other places that I went to that I really, I loved. And I discovered food. I mean, that was my really next question. Discovered. Yeah. On yeah. this, yeah. On this, this, uh, this idol that you were on. Yeah. It was amazing. And, and in fact, I do remember the first time I had, um, grits in the South. Oh. Um, and it was, I, I, I still to this day can remember this plate is, you know, very, it's a, industrial diner plate mm -hmm. and i just remember thinking to myself eating the, this biscuit that was i mean some of it could be that they just put so much butter inside the biscuit yes <laughs> yes that's probably true yeah yeah i was like taking a bite into like a a stick of butter and yeah. salt and flour it was it was amazing and i made it a point then to always try to to, and still do to wherever I go to have whatever is the native local, local thing. Yeah. 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 Um, and it was great. And it most of the time was dependent on if I knew someone there that was hosting me, cause I didn't have the money to go to like right. a restaurant. So mm -hmm. it would be somebody's home cooked, whatever, which is always best anyway, always best a hundred percent. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not just about the way the food is prepared. It's about, the hospitality and the effort and the sense of they're wanting you to be included in their community. That's what I food does. I never understood that. I never understood. It took me a long time to accept the idea that when you sit down for dinner, it's not that it's the whole experience is about yeah. the conversation. The whole right. is about the pacing that was just not available to me. It wasn't yeah. like, it wasn't a part of it. And today yeah, yeah. I have to like still um, pace myself. Not, I don't just mean like what I'm eating, but I mean, pace myself like this right. is a meal where I'm going to settle in mm -hmm. and you're going to really take your time through it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that not, on, not only from the standpoint of the actual consumption of the food, but also, who you're with and experiencing them. Uh, it's, uh, it's a ritual that is, uh, in a lot of American families, it's been lost. Yeah. I, you know, I'm thinking about, I was in a band during high school mm -hmm. and the drummer of this band lived in New Jersey. And this is a terribly embarrassing story, but. <laughs> Please but, go right ahead. But, um, this kid's mom was a very, um, she was nice. She was very nice, but she, we would go there and it was, I was clearly the roughest around the edges. These mm -hmm. the other guys in the band were, they came from like more financially secure backgrounds. Yeah. And I wasn't right. really used to like the sit down dinner. But mm -hmm. I could eat a lot of food, Chris. And he, he never, <laughs> my mom was making goulash's cousin. It was like right. a volume business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember going to this kid's house and his mom served, I don't know, what was that, whatever was on the plate. And I like 
just devoured it. Right. And this was during a period where my mom had lost her job. And his mom, without knowing, said, you know, what's wrong? D doesn't your mom feed you at home? And I, to this day, like, I'm, I like, take that i that really for some reason hit me really yeah. hard yeah so before i would ever go to somebody's house i would like duck out to like a mcdonald's or bring a sandwich to eat before i would eat so i wouldn't embarrass myself at somebody's house oh, um that's a, uh, that's really it's not a terrible story it's it's a, a very <laughs> deeply human story and also speaks a lot to your your sense of empathy. I don't know if it was empathy. I think I was just straight embarrassed that I felt protective in a way I think of my mom. Yeah, because, yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I but but eventually like Well, empathy for your mom too. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because I think my sister and my brother both are great, great cooks. Great. Mm -hmm. Um whereas for me, the first I didn't have a meal at a white tablecloth restaurant until I was in my twenties. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing for me. Mm. It was, it's like, and do you remember where it was? I, I don't remember. The restaurant was on 50. Ah, the Street. restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it was in Manhattan and I was meeting, um, you know, I was, I was married twice. So, you know, I was married yeah. to, to um, Rima was my, Rima. my late wife. Right. And uh, it was meeting her family, and she took me to this dinner. Ah. And I was I was terribly nervous. I mean, the good news was her dad is like the sloppiest eater on earth. Like, <laughs> if he doesn't walk out of a meal wearing at least half of the meal, right. so I felt right. a little bit better. Right. But right. I but I do remember. It sounds so crazy. It was like multiple forks and multiple spoons. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it was. It's overwhelming. Was, it can be. And I was so self-conscious anyway, because she was a lot more sophisticated than me. So mm -hmm. she was really um, the relationship I had that taught me about just the delicacy of food. And it wasn't about the fancy restaurant. In fact, the first time I really enjoyed a, a salad, we went to, I, you probably remember the diner on Bleecker Street in the West Village called Manatus. Manatus? Mm -hmm. Probably and Greek. Yeah, they had a yeah. Greek salad there. Yeah. That was like the best salad I ever had. Right. And I remember just being schooled by her in that experience. And mm -hmm. I really started to realize that I could actually enjoy food. Right. The in between was more like I can make soup from a ketchup packet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, so I'm going to jump now to your more current, that is post performing yeah, please. <laughs> uh, life. Uh, and, and just uh, to, to ask you, I know you travel a lot because I follow you online and you're, you know, you're all over the world very often. What do you look for when you travel in terms of food? Do you try to go out and experiment or do you, uh, what's, what's your, what are your eating habits like when you're on the road? I have never enjoyed food more than being someplace where somebody you know invites you to something local mm -hmm. musicians musicians or later on when i sort of had my executive life which right. is dangerous also because the hollow leg is not so hollow as you get older <laughs> right. so, uh, you know i didn't put on the freshman 15 when, when i got to college but i definitely put on the executive 20 when i was traveling around because everywhere you went as the president of a major music company right. was a, a big, every meal was a big meal. Every meal right. was an event. So, um, you know, that was the downside. The upside was a, a culinary tour that mm -hmm. was just spectacular. Um, and I've, I have to say, uh, making sure that you get someone local to tell you where to go yeah. is, if there was a, if there was a ten commandments of food, yep. getting a a local person would be maybe the first commandment or Absolutely. the second next to try anything. Yeah, right. And ten, by the way, for for those of you who are listening who do travel, uh, and who are watching as well, this is the best advice anybody's ever offered you. By the way, so take it and run yeah. with it. Well, it's also it's not so much that it's in 
it's expensive because in most of these countries, um, especially in Europe, these are countries that have um, survived so many years and generations of having, not having, and developing. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. we were recently in in Italy this past year, and I took my daughters, and as someone that never took vacations as a kid like that, yeah. taking my kids away is incredible. And my girls are foodies. I mean, so, so into it. And my youngest is eight, and my um, my older daughter is 15. So oh, how great. They're, they're obsessed with every little detail. That was the right. highlight of going to Italy. Mm -hmm. What I got out of the experience with them is when we would go out, we would read about the food in whatever yeah. area. And we went to Rome and Florence and we took a cooking class in Florence and made our own Ooh. pasta, which was, and went oh. shopping for it. Oh, and then we went to Milan. And what you learn is that whether it's um, risotto or the origins of pasta or Mussolini's policy over pasta, like things yeah. that I never even imagined existed. Yeah. yeah. It makes the whole experience more powerful. Oh, absolutely. And, and I almost wonder, I should get into this habit of Googling whatever we eat before a meal quickly and asking chat GPT to give me a paragraph on what, the origins of whatever <laughs> I'm eating because, because we, we do miss out on that, except for the Philadelphia cheesesteak, which, you know. Yeah, yeah. Was, well, that's one of the reasons, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, essentially, that's the, that's the origin of this podcast, which is essentially that we, we talk about the food we grew up with, and not only that, but the food that our children are growing up with, uh, and that uh, the history of it, whether it's uh, the history, is so intertwined with our family, with who we are, where we're from, um, what we become. Uh, it, we all have very, very vivid memories of those times in our life when we experience something really uh, seminal when it comes to food, because it, it branches out in so many different ways. I mean, I, you know, my log line for the show is not only about the food, but also about the people and the stories attached to those times, uh, which is why I, I'm, I'm thrilled that you could join me today. I, ha I have uh, uh, two more questions. You are very, very uh, intimately involved in uh, a couple of charities that I want to talk about. Now, you're, you're the autism uh, charity. Uh, can you tell the listeners and the viewers a little bit about that? Yeah, it's. I mean, that's been an evolving experience for me as a dad. To I have four kids, and right. um, both of my sons are on the spectrum on, on widely different places on the spectrum. Right, um, and uh, and that in, in terms of food is, I I I I hate to use the word controversy because I think there's so many voices in what is a massive, complex, layered community. Right. And um, so there are, there are a lot of people that feel like gut health is critical and diets that are gluten-free or otherwise um, can make a difference. And I think they can for a lot of different individuals. It really mm -hmm. depends. Um, but I think my wife, Jenna, and I got involved really um, initially with Autism Speaks and then really working behind the scenes in terms of legislation. And she had a company called Wolf and Friends, which got acquired a couple of years ago, which was about um, providing an online place for special needs moms to find one another. So sort of mm -hmm. think a, a dating app minus the romantic piece, but more geo-targeted wherever you were. So you had yeah. the resource of other parents. Um, and that um, I think was a great way for us to, one, therapeutic in terms of trying to do something for the greater community, um, but more born from realizing there's not a lot there. And when my oldest son was diagnosed, it was um, one in 175 kids were being diagnosed. And today it's, I think, one in 34. Wow. Um, and, the, and, this, and he's now 20. So you're talking about nearly two decades and an in unbelievably uh, huge increase. And I don't know the answer why. I mean, even if it was because there was greater diagnosis, mm -hmm. 
to to and, grow at that level right. is very unusual. And, and 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 because when we talk about autism, we talk about spectrum. Has the spectrum expanded in well, terms I, of diagnosis? I think what's changed is that um, there's a 25% of the autism population are more like my son. They're not really verbal. They need 24 hour care, my oldest son. Mm -hmm. Um, And they can't advocate for themselves in the typical way. And so, um, and you're talking, and there's a, an organization called the profound autism Alliance, um, which, um, I'm a supporter of they're a great organization. And you're finding that there are um uh pockets of the autism community and a lot of them are at odds. Um and I- I've been on the bleeding edge of the controversy of positions that mm-hmm. my wife and I feel too, like anybody else. But um there are also other individuals like my younger son who's doing incredibly well at college, goes to a a program, a neurodivergent uh, program um, that's incredible. And I learn from both of those experiences. Right. And and so I I think to your question, there are these segments of the population. Um, I also think it's hard for families and caregivers to know where to go. Yeah. Um, Autism Speaks is the largest umbrella organization. I think it's a great resource for people. I supported it for many years. Um, But I also feel like while a lot of autism organizations are celebrating autism and acceptance Mm -hmm. and awareness, all of which is critical, there is a large segment of of the autism community that are really struggling, struggling to make their way through school districts, struggling. Yeah financially and right. and struggling to wrap their arms around something that doesn't still have a lot of answers. Right. And, right. Uh, that there's not there's not an easy way to sort of fit. Okay, this is this is where you go for for a child who has this this problem. Correct. Yeah. So. Well, I, I appreciate you're talking about it because I have a feeling considering the 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 statistics that you just quoted that the, there'll be a number of our listeners out there who are affected by this in one way or another. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So I have one more question for you before we finish. And this is my, this is my, always my concluding question with all my guests. If there's one particular moment in your life where you think back, be it in your childhood or as you're growing older, in which a meal or a smell of something that takes you back to a time, or some, because we all have these, these moments in our life where, so, where we're exposed to something and suddenly we go back. Is mm-hmm. there one moment in your culinary history that takes you to that place where you feel, ah, oh, yeah, I remember this, and it was great? A hundred percent. I was, and I remember distinctly, um, I was in Germany on tour, um, and it was a particularly low period for me. You were performing, yeah. I was performing, yeah. I was yeah. on tour, um, and I was. I liked being on tour, but I was just. I felt like I was hydroplaning. I wasn't sure kind of where it was going. I was just going, but not with any. I didn't feel an anchor at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had a promotional day, um, and I went to a meal in Austria and I was very, uh, just uh, untethered. I don't know how to put it. I was like not attached to anything. Right. Um, and I felt homesick, but not sure where home was going to be. And I went into this restaurant and they served me a soup, a simple chicken soup that was precisely as my grandmother made it. And it was a simple chicken broth with very few sliced carrots, dill weed, sliced celery, where the vegetables were crisp, but cooked. Mm -hmm. And as they should be, I don't know why this is the moment but it really, I felt just 
connected in every way, sensory wise. And it, I felt very reassured. And mm -hmm. I felt this like hug from my ancestors, like yeah. you will be okay. Yeah. I, I know that that's not as exciting maybe as, you know, the, the greatest pasta ever. Although no, no. I did the first time I had white truffles was in Rome at a restaurant and I literally cried. And, <laughs> and Jenna, I looked at him, he was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, this is the greatest pasta I've ever had. But I'm only adding that in because it was. No, it was, no, it, absolutely. Like, I, I, you know, I have a, 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 I did a podcast with somebody who remembered his grandmother taking bread and putting butter on it and pouring sugar on it and putting it under a fire. And it, you know, crisped it up. And that was the thing that brought him to, to in a way, to home. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. In the, music, in the big picture, home. Music and food yeah. are incredible time machines. Yeah. Because you can hear a song from some other era in your life and be metaphysically transported to a moment and a feeling. And food can do the same thing. There are very few things that have that magic ability. So I um I haven't thought about that bowl of soup in a long time, but uh, but I thank remember you. <laughs> thank you for well, asking. Well I, I I can't think of a better place to conclude this with that that expression that you just uh, uh, gave us. Uh, Billy Man, thank you. I can't tell you how much fun this has been just uh, reliving your life with you. <laughs> and uh, I I hope to see you soon. All right. Thanks, Chris. You're the best. All I'm the so best. happy I could do this.